So isotropic elasticity is the elastic behavior of materials that are, uh, behave the same whatever direction you stretch them in. That is, it's iso the same everywhere, however you view it, tropic. Um, and actually, this is an assumption that's very rarely really true for most materials. Um, that's because uh, most crystals have some uh, anisotropy to them, owing to which way you're stretching the bonds, um, even cubic crystals. And most materials, when they're deformed, deform plastically anisotropically. Um, that is, there are slip systems operating on particular slip planes that gives rise to some anisotropy. And the way they solidify is also anisotropic, and the way they recrystallize is also anisotropic. So most materials have an orientation distribution of the grains in them, um, and that is called a texture, by the way. Um, and that orientation distribution gives rise to some elastic anisotropy which we'll consider in the next lecture, in Lecture 7. But first, we'll think about the simple case where we assume that it's isotropic. Most mechanical engineers will stay with that assumption, um, and it's just one of those sort of articles of faith. It's isotropic, really. I'm going to pretend that it is. But reality isn't like that, um, and we're doing condensed matter science, so we want to think about reality a bit more than ideal mechanics. Um, and the first place to go with elasticity is Hooke's law. So. Um, the generalized version of Hooke's law is this. Uh, the generalized Hooke's law. And what that says is that the Young's modulus times the normal strain in the one direction so really we should call it strain 1, 1, is equal to the stress in the 1, 1 direction, the normal stress, minus the Poisson's ratio times the sum of the stresses in the two perpendicular directions. Previously, you've just seen this part of the equation, and you've assumed that it's just a tensile test and there are no other stresses applied. And then you've said that strain 2, 2, or the strain in a second direction, is equal to minus mu times strain 1, 1. And when you add on a stress in the two direction, that then gives you a strain in the one direction, uh, which is related to E, and also multiplied by mu. So this is the generalized version for when you have normal stresses in three different directions. And the shears, shears in this, for the normal strains at least, don't come into it. And the thing to, to realize, uh, Poisson and Hook uh, were all people. So it's Poisson's ratio with an apostrophe, Young's, and Hooke's. Um, and this implies these cyclically permute. So we can say E strain 2, 2 is equal to sigma 2, 2 minus mu, sigma 3, 3 plus sigma 1, 1. And we can say E strain 3, 3 is equal to sigma 3, 3 minus mu, sigma 1, 1 plus sigma 2, 2. OK. Um, but we assume that we understand that they cyclically permute, so we, we usually only quote one of them. And people, depending on how lazy they are, may or may not call them strain 1, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. Um, and by which they don't necessarily mean that they're principal stresses. They don't have to be principal stresses. They're just avoiding the repeated index. Um, there's a thing as to whether you call them stresses and tors um, or just sigma ij's. Um, I prefer sigma ij's, personally, because it's more tensory. It's more generic. Um, and in shear, you alternatively have the following. You have that sigma ij for i is not equal to j is equal to twice g strain ij. What you previously saw was equal, was equal to g gamma, and gamma was equal to uh, strain ij was equal to gamma over 2. So if you put in uh, strain ij is equal to gamma over 2 into here, then you get that equation. So, that so this is the tensor way to define the shear modulus. Um, and the shear modulus is g here, and he, the shear modulus doesn't have a person, I'm afraid. Um, now, one thing it, it's sort of interesting to ask is how might these be interrelated? Um, so... Let's think about 
a situation. Now, to think about this, we're going to need to to do some work with some tensors, with some strain tensors, and it's worth remembering or recalling that strain is a tensor, so it rotates like any other tensor, just like a stress tensor does. So all the things we did with stress tensors, um, all the circle, everything else works exactly the same. So uh, strain is a tensor. It's actually a a real symmetric tensor. So it rotates just like a stress tensor. And that's worth remembering. We'll remember that. And so what I'm going to consider is I'm going to consider a situation where I've applied a pure shear stress. So I'm going to consider a stress matrix of 0, sigma, 0, sigma, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So that's a pure shear stress matrix. And we would therefore find that the strain matrix correspondingly would be, or strain tensor, uh, would therefore be given by uh, sigma over 2g, 0, 0, sigma over 2g, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay. Now, this stress tensor I can rotate about the z axis, about this axis here, the 3 axis, let's call it about the 3 axis, by 45 degrees. Because if I take a Mohr circle of it, what I'll have is I'll have 0, comma, sigma, 0, comma, sigma. There's my Mohr circle. And my principal stresses will be a 45 degree rotation, that is 90 degrees in Mohr circle, to plus sigma and minus sigma. So that rotation of 45 degrees about the three axis gives me a rotated stress matrix of sigma minus sigma. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay. Now, if I put that into my generalized Hooke's law, I can find out uh, what the strains are going to be. So the strain here, strain 1, 1, is going to be uh, times E, is going to be sigma minus mu minus sigma plus naught. That is, it's equal to twice uh, sigma, no, sorry, sigma times 1 plus mu. And the same will be true of E strain 2, 2. E strain 2, 2 is equal to minus sigma minus sigma times mu, and the 0 goes away, so that's equal to sigma or minus sigma times 1 plus mu. So my rotated strain matrix in this rotated frame of reference is equal to um, uh, sigma times 1 plus mu over E. Um, and again, uh, minus sigma times 1 plus mu over E. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay, now, if I want to take that back to my original frame of reference, I've got to do another Mohr circle, and I've got a Mohr circle between sigma 1 plus mu over E, comma naught, and minus sigma times 1 plus mu over E, comma naught. And that's another really simple Mohr circle. That's one of these. The center's at 0, and the radius is sigma times 1 plus mu over E. And that's then 0, comma, and the same down here. So my rotated strain matrix is going to give me then, when I rotate that back by 45 degrees, whoop, that is 90 in Mohr's circle, I get shear strains of um, 0, sigma times 1 plus mu over E, 0, sigma times 1 plus mu over E, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And these must be the same thing. So I can say that this term and this term are the same. So what I have 
is sigma over 2g is equal to sigma 1 plus mu over e. So if I take this up there, that up there, cancel the sigmas, what I've got is that 2g is equal to e over 1 plus mu. Very good. Um, and um, what do I need to do? Um, so E12 is equal to that. Um, yeah, that's just fine. So that's equation 80 in the notes. Okay, so this, it turns out, G isn't an independent modulus at all. There are, it's only a, a restatement of the Young's modulus and the Poisson's ratio. So there are only two, so far, independent isotropic elastic constants. So here we can say that G is equal to E over twice 1 plus mu. And we'll write that down as our conclusion. Now... The other stress state we can consider, and um, that you've thought about before, is what happens when we pressurise a material. And what we've said, what you might well have seen, is that if we apply a pressure to a material, the hydrostatic stress will relate to the change in volume by a thing called the bulk modulus, big K. Um, so that's how easy it is to squish the atoms together. Um, and K, we call this change in volume also delta. And delta is equal to the sum of the strains along uh, the trace of the strain tensor. Um, and uh, that is the, the, the trace of uh, uh, epsilon ij. Um, and that's different to the way we define the hydrostatic stress. The hydrostatic stress is equal to a third of the trace of the stress matrix, or equal to a third of sigma 1, 1 plus sigma 2, 2 plus sigma 3, 3. That is, it's the average normal stress, whereas the dilatation is the sum of them. It's just the way it sort of naturally works out. Um, so uh, there's a little thing to be aware of there. Now, this is, is more direct. If we take the, apply the generalized Hooke's law to this, if we take E strain 1, 1 is equal to sigma 1, 1 minus mu sigma 2, 2 plus sigma 3, 3, if we add it to the other two variants of Hooke's law, if we just cyclically commute, If we just add up the left-hand sides and add up the right-hand sides, what we get is we get E times delta is equal to 3 times the hydrostatic stress times 1 minus 2 mu. Okay, um, so you see that if we add those th together, we get a sigma 1, 1 minus mu sigma 1, 1 minus mu sigma 1, 1, so 1 minus 2, 1 of the mu of sigma 1, 1's, and we do that with sigma 1, 1, 2, 2, and 3, 3, and that's equal to 3 sigma h. So, if we compare that to our definition of the bulk modulus, there we had k delta was equal to sigma h. So, if we uh, go and substitute for um, those two, what we're going to say is that k is equal to E divided by 3 times 1 minus 2 mu. So we substitute for delta is equal to sigma h over k um, in there. Sigma h over k, for instance, substituting from there. Cancel the sigma h's, bring the k up here, bring that down there, you get this equation. So the bulk modulus also isn't an independent elastic constant, it's just a refiguring of E and mu. Okay, now the last one to mention is the following. 
these are ways of finding uh, the relationship between the stress and the strain. That is, given the stress, you can find the strain. Okay. Um, now, if we don't want to do that, if we want to go the other way, if we know the strains and want to find the stresses, this is going to be a real hassle to use. Um, and that's quite commonly going to be the case because what happens a lot of the time is that uh, we can measure strains. That is, we can measure how much the lattice parameters have changed or we can measure uh, motions of materials using a displacement gauge. Um, but it's very difficult to measure stress itself unless you ha happen to have a, a stress measurement device, which is actually a strain measurement device that's configured. So a load cell is actually a, a, a big strain sensor, in fact. Um, it's just a very stiff one. And uh, if you look at a, a um, in most cases, uh, if you therefore what we tend to measure in reality isn't the strain energy density, that is stress, it's the strain. Um, uh, and therefore we then convert that to a stress because we want to relate it to what happens in a tensile test or to a material behavior curve. So if you want to go the other way, what you do is you take three generalized Hooke's laws like these, the three permutations of them, and then solve to find strain 1, 1, or strain 2, 2, and stra uh, sorry, sigma 1, 1, or sigma 2, 2, or sigma 3, 3. And if you do that, you get the following equation which, again, you can permute cyclically at will. Plus. So that's what you get if you take your three permutations of Hooke's law and solve to find sigma. Um, and this is... Of course, this is equal to 2g, this is equal to delta, and this is called Lame's constant. So you can also write it down like that, and that's Lame's constant. So like a llama, but it's Lame's constant. And uh, this is mu e over 1 plus mu 1 minus 2 mu. And that's, uh, if you like, this is what's going on with the hydrostatic strain. Uh, that is with the dilatation, the volume change, and this is what's going on with the elastic strain in the one direction. Um, and this is all, by the way, for elastic strains. Um, so that's how we relate uh, the strains to the stress. And the last little thing I should say about what we did last time when we decomposed the deformation tensor into a symmetric strain tensor and an anti-symmetric spin tensor. This was for elastic. Well, when we're talking about it here, this is for elastic strains. We could actually decompose it into an elastic part and a plastic part if we wanted to do so. Um, and then all of this stuff we've been talking about with isotropic elasticity is only talking about that elastic part. But usually we'll be, in this course at least, only talking about the elastic case. We won't consider plasticity. We won't consider what happens beyond the point of yield. We'll go up to yield, think about where we get to yield, but we won't consider what happens beyond it. Um, so that's the last little thing to say. So that's isotropic elasticity. For the rest of this lecture we'll do a few problems, uh, and then in the next lecture we'll talk about anisotropic elasticity. And that's it for this segment.